So, um, the goal of uh, today's lecture is to um, introduce you guys to basic ideas and concepts in high throughput sequencing. Um, and the idea is that the goal is that uh, that should give you some uh, knowledge about how to better design and better analyze uh, high throughput sequencing experiments. Um, so the plan of the lecture is as follows. Uh, um, I'm going to give you a very short introduction about uh, what high throughput sequencing is used for. Uh, we're going to talk about Illumina technology because that's the uh, sequencing technology that most people use. Uh, 80% of the market, even more than 80% of the market in terms of sequencing is, uh, is Illumina's. Uh, we're going to talk about primary data analysis, uh, which is um, basically alignment, quality control. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the format in which the short reads that come out of the sequences are being installed uh, for analysis. Uh, we're going to talk about secondary analysis, which is um, the actual sort of biological analysis that you do in deep sequencing data. <coughs> Includes uh, transcript level quantification. Um, hopefully, we'll have time to cover uh, visualization of uh, short read data. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you a, a few slides about uh, useful biconductor packages for analyzing deep sequencing data. And then uh, we might not have time for this, but it's on the slides. Uh, we might talk about challenges and how the uh, sequencing uh, technology evolved. This is also um, meant to be an introduction for tomorrow's lab. Um, that's going to be uh, taught by a grad student, grad student in my lab, uh, Matt. Um, he'll, he'll tell you about um, operations in genomic intervals. Uh, which is useful when it comes to analyzing reads and uh, taking the intersection union between uh, ranges and intervals. Uh, he'll talk about BAM files and, and some useful packages that you can use to import or uh, do operations on uh, BAM files. He'll talk about how to import short reads into R, uh, how to do uh, quality control. He'll tell you about how to display some genomic data into the USC genome browser using the r track layer package. Uh, and he'll talk about uh, genome sequences and, and the manipulation using the BM genome package. Okay. So, uh, what high throughput sequencing is used for? Uh, so, you know, many of you guys have used high throughput sequencing. Um, obviously, you know, it's used for um, full genome sequencing. Uh, this is the first paper actually that reported the uh, sequencing of a uh, of a full genome using short reads. Huh? Um, I was a cancer genomes and a leukemia genome. Uh, and just to give you a sense, this is, these are statistics, these are numbers about how many reads and how many runs of a sequencer, that was you know, a little while ago now, uh, was used uh, to sequence the genomes. So we're talking about 100 runs uh, for, the genome, for one genome. Uh, obviously, it's a cancer genome, so they had to sequence a germline uh, counterpart in the same, uh, in the same individual. Uh, this is how many runs they did. They did. That was on the GA2, uh, the very first incarnation in Illumina technology. Um, so, what, so, many years ago. so this is the number of reads that they got. Um, so as you can tell, you know, this is, you know, these are large numbers here. Um, this is what they got out of it, uh, a list of about 10 mutations um, with some information about what these mutations are doing and so on and so forth. Okay. This is kind of one application of genome sequencing. Um, since, since then people have as you, as you may have seen from, from papers in Nature and Science and New England Journal of Medicine, I mean, people keep okay sequencing uh, full genomes, especially cancer genomes, um, and, and, and find, you know, very interesting uh, patterns. This is a paper in which uh, they use pattern sequencing to identify translocations, so chain translocations in this cancer genome. Um, very interesting uh, type of analysis. Um, hold, I mean, uh, uh, Deep sequencing is also used to do targeted sequencing, which is not sequencing the whole genome, but sequencing only uh, specific regions uh, using capture. Basically, you have oligos that are complementary, complementary to specific regions in the genome. You use these oligos to pull down uh, DNA that you want to capture and then you sequence it. Um, this, is, uh, this is used quite a bit. Um, and, and exome sequencing is one incarnation of this, where you have a kit that's given to you by a, a reagent vendor. Illumina or Agilent that has uh, oligos for all of the axons in the human genome that allows you to capture the entire genome uh, and sequence it. Again, this is a technology that's used quite a bit. 
Um, there are uh, people using um, sequencing to do all kinds of assays. Uh, this is uh, DNA methylation profiling uh, using whole genome sequencing, using deep sequencing. Uh, it's based on the technique called bisulfate conversion. Anybody has heard of this? Okay, so what is it? What, what, uh, how does it work? So can can tell me can uh, somebody explain what uh, what all that what that means? So basically, the bisulfate chain will change the cytokine into a nucleus. Uh, therefore, after the sequencing, you will find kind of a mutation from a CG to a uh, AG. Right. So you map the genome. So how do you map uh, reads or bisulfate converted back to the genome? Anybody knows? You can convert the somebody of the genome when you convert all the genes into C and then malign disease to go to the genome. Right. And so that's basically that's the change you made as I see it in my map. That's right. So basically you align the short reads you know, to a reference genome that you converted artificially in silico in the computer basically. Um, where you converted all of the C's uh, to use. Um, and that basically It gives you information about uh, which uh, cytosines are methylated. So what, how does it work? Which cytosines are methylated in bisulfate sequencing? How can you tell how the cytosine is methylated? Is that a methylated uh, cytosine? If you have a if you if you uh, if you have a cytosine that's been converted to a uracil, uh, no, so, so you're reading that cytosine which is the main. So basically, it's protection from conversion that tells you that you have methylated cytosine. Right? So every time that you have a, a C a cytosine that's converted to a, to a, to a uracil, uh, it uh, means that there was no methylation at that site because there was no protection by the methyl group on the DNA. So basically, sequencing is used I mean, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, identify methylation at single nucleotide resolution genome. Right. So, so how do you map it if only half of the cytosines are methylated? You don't know which half. Um, what do you mean? Yeah, so, OK. Uh, what you're saying is that, um, I mean, typically, so these experiments rely multiple and basically the positioning of the genome, the cytosine being covered by multiple reads, right? Uh, if you have only one read that covers a position, you can't really tell too much about what's happening. It could be, you know, it could be uh, a sequencing error, it could be, could be, you know, a methylation, you know, event. But typically you have one cytosine that's covered multiple <coughs> reads, uh, and you count how many cytosines at that position have been converted, and you can't which ones have not been converted. And that gives you a methylation a ratio if you want, and if your methylation ratio is in the order of 50%, and if you have a population that's reasonably pure in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the tumor, you know, the, the cell type, then it tells you that you have uh, one copy of a chromosome that's methylated and the other one is not. Is that, does that answer your question? Or? Um, no, but I heard... No, do you, uh, tell me what, uh, which, uh, which you have in mind. So you said you could map to a, a, a genome where you've artificially converted all the C's Yeah, so you definitely, you know, it is true that uh, you have to tolerate more mismatches uh, than, and, uh, you know, than, than, uh, and, and uh, the alignment, you know, software has to tolerate more mismatches. Now, what I also want to say is that in bisulfate sequencing, you also finish the conversion of the reads. So, you know, you make sure, because it's just mapping at the end of the day, so you're only interested in mapping your reads back to the genome. So you're right that you have a read that's going to have some methylation events and some cytosines are not going to be methylated, so you're going to, you're going to have a mix. What you do is, in addition to converting the entire genome to a bisulfate reference genome, you also finish the conversion of the read itself so that you can actually map it with actually better, uh, better accurate. But you keep, you store the original version of a read so that you can revert back to it uh, when you do a calculation of a fraction of methylation. Okay. Any question on bisulfate? 
um, sequencing. You'll have a lecture tonight uh, about uh, somebody who's here at Kolsvinger Arbor who's actually using that technique to, uh, to uh, study some biological, uh, uh, biological problems. Um, so you'll be able to uh, get more details about it. Uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Really, it's you know, really meant to be interactive. Uh, uh, don't, don't be shy. So uh, this is RNA-seq. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, this technology. This is, a, uh, this is kind of a, you know, the workhorse of, of, uh, of uh, application of deep sequencing. Uh, it's basically sequencing RNAs. Um, that involves uh, multiple steps. Huh? Uh, typically, uh, you start with a, an mRNA that has a polyethyl. You uh, convert this uh, mRNA into cDNA uh, using a polity primer, um, and then you fragment uh, the, 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 the cDNAs. You add adapters to the cDNAs on, on, either, on both ends, uh, um, and you sequence uh, these short fragments using hydrogen sequencing. You map back those reads back to the genome, right? and you count uh, for each gene in the genome how many reads map onto that gene. We'll get back to this. We'll get back to FPKMs or RPKMs uh, in a few slides. Okay. And this is ChipSeq. Uh, uh, how does ChipSeq work? You guys uh, okay, kind of tells you a few things about it, but you know, how does it work? What's the what's the uh, how does the technology work? Has anybody done ChipSeq here? The chip -seek. So how does it work? So that's the sequence, right? And so how do you, how do you identify a binding site for a protein? Uh, what is it, well, how, how can you tell? So you have your short reads and how, where, how, does, how does the binding site look like? The binding site looks like many reads piled up on top of each other. Right, right. That's right. So basically, this is one here, uh, one illustration of, a, uh, of a, uh, a binding site for a protein. As you can see, lots of reads uh, that have uh, been pulled down to give us DNA and a protein of interest that's written as right antibody uh, mapped back to the genome and forming a peak like this. Uh, we'll also go back to peak detection, not in this lecture, but uh, in the lecture on Thursday. Um, and so people also using uh, high throughput sequencing to do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, a high throughput mapping of chromatin interactions uh, using high throughput using, uh, sequencing. Um, this is basically a try to identify the loci of the genes that are far away on the genome, but actually come close to each other uh, in three dimension, right, in the nucleus. Uh, you can actually use hyperfood sequencing to do this. Uh, and this is, in fact, uh, something, this is a, uh, an attempt at a reconstruction of a three-dimensional genome, let's say an average picture of a three-dimensional three -dimensional genome uh, that we did in my lab. Uh, uh, we actually published this last year in PNAS. Uh, that was on the prostate uh, epithelial cells. It's an average picture uh, of a three-dimensional reconstruction of the of the, of the, of the genome. Uh, well, each of the um, each of the colors that corresponds to a different chromosome. Uh, this is also to uh, illustrate the fact that uh, people are now are kind of mixing up all these techniques. You know, people are, are essentially doing integrative analysis uh, using multiple application of high throughput sequencing. They're sequencing for the same individuals, the genome, the epigenome, the RNA seq, uh, and so on and so forth. This is actually a study that came out um, a couple of years ago now, uh, looking at uh, monozygotic twins that it's discordant for a disease. In this case, it was multiple sclerosis. So they did all of this, um, all of these assays on uh, these, two, these, these, uh, these twins that uh, basically shouldn't have the same genome. Uh, they are uh, monozygotic, but one of the one of the twin member had a, had multiple sclerosis, um, and they basically the crux of the paper is that they actually didn't find a difference. There was no difference in the genome, epigenome, or no clear difference in terms of rna uh, between these two twins, uh, even though one had uh, uh, multiple sclerosis and the other one did it. But just to illustrate the fact that people are using up now you know, these techniques together uh, and, and performing integrated analysis. Um, okay. And this is uh, many other applications of high throughput sequencing uh, for gene fusion detection, uh, translational profiling. We'll have a, uh, a speaker in a, in a few days that's going to tell us about translational profiling. Basically, tells you uh, uh, 
you know, which mRNA is localized to ribosomes, and actually now there are actually better approaches to doing this where you can actually detect where precisely on mRNAs ribosomes are actually binding. Uh, it gives you essentially a footprint of ribosomal localization under the mRNAs. Um, people do small microRNA sequencing. Uh, they sequence bacterial communities from guts, from you know, skin, from everywhere. Uh, people can look at protein RNA interaction. Just to give you a sense that you know, hyperbolic sequencing has just used you know, for many, many, many types of assays. Really, really powerful technology that's really uh, that's been changing the game when it comes to, uh, to uh, uh, understanding the biology of, of, uh, of cells, including human cells. Okay. Questions so far? So let's get to Illumina technology. As I was telling you, this is really uh, the dominant technology in uh, hyperbolic sequencing. Um, this is how it works. Huh? Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, this is technology on which uh, you start with DNA, uh, typically from uh, 0.1 to 1 microgram of DNA. Uh, these are uh, fragments of DNA to which you attach adapters. Um, these are Illumina adapters provided by the And what you're doing is so you, you, you have essentially millions and billions of DNA fragments, all of which have adapters, different adapters on both ends. Um, and what you do is that you wash these uh, DNA fragments into a lot of primers. And each of the primer is uh, complementary to one of, the other, one of the two adapters. Okay. And the idea is that your DNA fragments are going to uh, bind essentially to become fixed somewhere randomly into a slide. Become attached to the slide. Okay, like this. Um, now, the goal, uh, the goal of the technology is to get some signal out of the uh, out of uh, each of these DNA fragments. You want to sequence each of these fragments. Each of these fragments by itself is not going to give you enough signal. So, what people do, what the technology is doing, is essentially to expand this uh, DNA fragments here um, in situ at the same location. And the way that's done is by growing clusters. And the way this is working is basically by building, uh, by essentially forcing the DNA fragments, with, first of all, denaturing the two strands, uh, right? So you have single strand. Uh, and if you have, the strand is going to bend like this and hybridize to a, uh, another primer that's complementary to the other end, uh, uh, very, very low quality on the slide, like this, and form a bridge like this, okay? It's a single strand. And what you do is then to uh, use uh, additional primers here and basically do a kind of a round of, of, of PCR where you uh, reconstitute the other strand like this. Okay, so builds and now you have a, a double strand DNA bridge. Okay. Um, and essentially you continue to do this operation by releasing one of the ends and continuing to expand to essentially uh, uh, do this, this uh, bridging and this, uh, uh, this amplification you continue doing these operations until you get a, uh, a very large number of copies of the same DNA fragment at the same location. Okay. What's the goal of this? Why do you need so many, why do you have uh, so many copies of the same fragment like this? What, what's, what's, why is it going to help you? The idea is that you're going to read something about the, sequen the, the sequencing process itself, and if you have one fragment, the signal that you get from this one DNA fragment is not going to be strong enough. Because you're doing that high throughput, essentially. You know, it's really kind of looking at multiple, uh, you know, millions and millions of its clusters on the slide, uh, and it's going to be a lot of background noise. So you essentially need to amplify the signal, and this is what this uh, amplification of these uh, local amplification of the fragments is doing. It's trying to amplify the signal uh, that's going to come out of the sequence. Yeah. Okay. This is called cluster growth. So the next step uh, is to actually sequence uh, these fragments. Huh? Uh, so if the sequencing is working by synthesis, uh, and you start from the top right, of the fragments, huh? so you kneel a primer to the top uh, to the adapter that's at the top like this. right? And then uh, what you do is to essentially wash your slide with nucleotides. Right? Nucleotides are labeled with a fluorescent, uh, a fluorescent uh, uh, probe, if you want. Um, and the idea is that uh, you start from the top like this, right? And you have multiple nucleotides huh, that are there in the same pool, okay? And uh, the idea is that uh, you're gonna see which nucleotide is incorporating into the DNA fragment, into some of the, 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 the nascent uh, uh, DNA fragment on the other side, okay? One nucleotide is going to incorporate because that's the one that's complementary to the, to the nucleotide that's on the other, on the other side. 
And so this is the uh, nucleus that's going to be read uh, by, the, uh, by the sequence. It's essentially a scanner that's going to flash um, light onto uh, the slide. And uh, that's going to give rise to fluorescence. And it's going to give you the identity of the nucleotide that's been incorporated. Okay. Um, the, the next step is to uh, actually uh, stop um, the incorporation. So it's actually to continue the incorporation. The idea is that each of these nucleotides, also, in addition to having a fluorescent group, also has a terminator uh, type of uh, capacity. So essentially, when you incorporate a nucleotide, you can't continue to incorporate the next one. Okay? It's blocked. Right? Yeah. So the laser, uh, uh, what's, what comes after the laser illumination is a step that's releasing the nucleotide here and the last incorporation of another nucleotide after, after that one. Okay. And that's how you continue to. These are images here of the uh, acquisition. Uh, each of the dots here corresponds to a cluster. And as you can see, you have, uh, for each a nuclear type that's incorporated, you have an image, right? And the images are uh, essentially evolving, uh, changing. Uh, but all of the, the key is to kind of follow the same dot uh, at uh, the same location across multiple incorporations. Right? Okay? So the, 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 there's a scanner and there's image detection that's uh, giving you the identity of uh, the nuclear that, that are incorporated at each step. Uh, and that's how we could do reconstruct the sequence of the, of the data fragment that you uh, that you sequence here. Okay. Questions? No. And yeah, so basically if you follow the same uh, spot, you end up with a sequence. So this is a very good question. So uh, the technology you know, is essentially uh, uh, tuned uh, so as to minimize the number of dots that are allowed. Uh, but you're absolutely right, and you can see some of these guys here. Sometimes you have dots that are very close to each other. Right? Uh, and it's actually not always easy to tell, uh, you know, to tell apart essentially the two colors that you have in the two, in the two dots. And that's actually been a huge part of the reason why some of you may have realized that you know, the, the, uh, the sequencing throughput has increased a huge amount, you know, in recent years. One of the reasons why it's increased so much is that uh, Illumina has been able to come up with better software, better able to discriminate between these dots that are very, very close to each other. It essentially has been able to rescue a very large number of these, uh, of these clusters uh, that, you know, were close to each other before, you know, the software was not able to read them. Uh, now it's actually able to better discriminate between these, uh, these so uh, partly software, uh, partly also uh, uh, you know, improving the, the, some of the design, including the location of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the primers, you know, the lawn, uh, so as to minimize this effect. Uh, that's led to actually a huge increase in, uh, in uh, uh, sequencing capacity. Yeah. Is there use to add new stuff or like the Say again? Um, so, so that once you get, once you sequence the entire fragment, essentially, uh, you're kind of done with this. I mean, there's pattern sequencing where, you know, you kind of, you sequence from the, from the other extremities. Uh, that's basically just, you know, another, another, uh, another round, but, um, but the, 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 the new strand is not used. You don't, uh, regrow clusters, you know, you kind of grow clusters at the beginning and that's it. Uh, that's, that's how. Yeah, so Illumina technology is not known to be too prone uh, to this uh, repeat nucleotide uh, uh, issues that other technologies have, have, uh, have problems with. Them. So, you know, Ion Torrent, for example, is a technology that has uh, issues with uh, 4DA tracks or, you know, repeats. Um, Illumina technology is, is, is actually, you know, is doing, is doing okay. And like you say, it's partly due, due to the fact that you stop the incorporation after each nucleotide. Uh, the nucleotides are, you know, have a, a, a chemical modification that leads to stopping uh, incorporation. Uh, so it's not really a problem. I mean, you know, repeats um, are problematic for many, many reasons. Uh, 
uh, you know, during alignment, you know, when you have, you know, micro satellites, when you have, you know, short with multiple, uh, multiple, let's say, you know, uh, copies of the same repeats like CA, CA, CA. If you align them to the genome, and, you know, the genome has uh, a polymorphism, it has a different number of CA, CA, CAs, right? It has uh, just one CA insertion, for example. If you multiple reads uh, that you're going to map to the same location, the location of the insertion or deletion in the reads, because different from the genome, is not going to be at the same location right, uh, between the reads, because the alignment is done one read at a time. And that, that's creating all kinds of problems, you know, in terms of indel detection. Uh, uh, but it's not so much a technology, it's more the, 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 sort of the, the, the software itself. Yeah. The longest uh, yeah, so uh, the longest fragment that uh, uh, now you can sequence using Illumina sequencing is 250 nucleotides per then. So meaning uh, you have a DNA fragment, you sequence 250 nucleotides in one direction, 250 in the other direction. That basically allows you to sequence pretty much 500 base pair uh, uh, pieces of DNA. This is the maximum now that Illumina is uh, giving you now, it's, this is actually a technology, you know, an incarnation of a technology that's not so much um, used on the iSeq 2000 or iSeq 100, but on the MySeq, this is something that, you know, uh, is used all the time. This uh, 250 uh, per day. Yes? So, when you're doing the paradigm based, you, you're doing the red, the red and then you're washing and you're doing the blue, right? That's right, until you start again, that's right. Right, so this is, uh, this is completely part of uh, the, de the design of your experiment. And it, the, you know, it's part of what you want to get out of the experiment. Right? So you know, depending on um, what you want to achieve, uh, you would do pair or single end. For example, if you want to do, um, if you want to uh, uh, detect novel isoforms using RNA-seq, what, uh, what, uh, what do you need to do? What, uh, does anybody know what he needs to do? Hmm? Right. You need to you need to do pattern sequencing so that you can bridge exons and reconstruct uh, isoforms essentially. Uh, uh, if you do if you're doing chip seek, um, what you what what should you do? Single end or pair end? Basically single end. You're not getting much by sequencing the two extremities of the same fragment when it comes to chip seek. Uh, you know, we saw some pictures of chip seek analysis. You know, chip seek is basically, you know, sequencing your uh, whole damn DNA, mapping it to the genome. You look by, you have a peak, and that's it. You're done. You know, the information about you know the two ends of the same fragment mapping to some location is not really helping you so much uh, in terms of identifying the location and finding sites. Okay. So it really depends on the application. That's really the bottom line. Yeah. The sequencing is done, so you have cluster growth, that's one, uh, that's one step, and then, and, you know, and then you, that's it, you, know, you don't go back to it. You, in fact, don't even do the cluster growth on, this, on, the, on the Illumina machine, you do it in a separate machine. Uh, but this, the sequencing itself, is happening after all of the clusters are grown. And again, the idea is that you know, all of these fragments at the same location are sequenced at the same time. So this fluorescent signal that you're getting from each nucleotide, you're actually getting it from all of the fragments. So you're getting a very strong signal from the cluster. That's really you know, the, the key aspect of the Illumina sequencing. Yeah. So this is uh, single and this pattern sequencing. In single, uh, single uh, read sequencing, basically uh, the, the technology chooses one extremity of the read to, to the uh, DNA fragment to sequence randomly either one or the other in pattern. And this is what comes out of the machine, uh, more or less. Uh, these are uh, short reads in FASQ format. Um, does anybody know um, what, all, what that all means? Huh? So let's start with uh, this line. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but this is what, what does that mean, this line here? This is what? This is. Okay, so this is what? Yeah. 
this is a lane number. Lane. Yeah, this is a lane number. This is the cluster location. What does that mean by cluster location? X, Y, coordinates. Right. This is the X, Y coordinates on the underflow cell, on the underlane, sorry. Right. So each remember each cluster is coming from a location on the on the on the lane, right? Uh, it's being read by the software that's reading that's reading uh, 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 fluorescence fluorescent dots on the on the uh, on the lane, right? And so this gives you uh, the coordinate of the uh, this section. It's not particularly important, uh, although, you know, if you are into these kind of things, uh, you need, uh, there are potentially ways to look at artifacts, right? I mean, if you know the location of, uh, uh, you know, of the, 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 the read on the, on, the, on the lane, right, you can potentially model the effect of the location on, of, of, uh, the, location on the sequence itself. You can model whether the location on the lane is actually uh, Giving rise to you know artifacts you know, in terms of sequencing, you can imagine that, for example, if uh, the, the the dot, the fluorescent dots, are located towards the extremities of the of the lane, you know, close to the to the to the edges of the lane, that could give rise to uh, to artifacts in terms of reading the uh, the sequence itself. Right. So you could you could use that that information to model uh, certain uh, potential uh, artifacts. Yes. Uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, most piece, most duplicates are coming from PCR. Um, cluster growth, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you get a, you get a, you know, I mean, unless you can read, you know, two, um, you know, two dots, you know, within, for, well, well, it should be only one dot. I mean, that shouldn't give you too much, you know, that should give us a very limited uh, uh, duplicate. Most of this, you know, chronology problem is coming from PCR, from the PCR steps. You can tell, you know, if you do more PCR, you get, you know, many more, you know, core reads. You know, this is, uh, we've seen this, you know, over and over. Uh, it's, it's mostly the PCR. Uh. Um, so the cluster growth, what happens if your library size is PKB? Right. Yeah, so you could be, uh, I guess, not, not talking about running for ops, but you know, there's more kind of uh, growth definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it basically, you know, Illumina, uh, Almost forces you to uh, do it, well, forces you to do site select essentially the fragments, and there is an optimal size for cluster growth. Um, I actually even believe that the clusters, you know, the, the, if you have very long fragments, the clusters actually, you know, don't form very well. Uh, it's not only that the, you know, the DARs are too large, but also the clusters don't form very well if your fragments are very long. So, you know, if you, you can you can do it, you can actually, uh, you know, feed uh, very large fragments to the sequencer. Uh, they just essentially won't get sequenced. Won't see them uh, back uh, you know, out of the, you know, the, 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 the sequence. So, um, so there's an optimal range, which is in the order of 200 to 150 base pair long uh, fragments. That's uh, you know, that's useful. I mean, you can all you can do all sorts of uh, library preparation to uh, identify this longer, uh, to essentially sequence longer fragments. Um, what you can do is to uh, uh, you can you can uh, circularize within a fragment uh, and create a junction. Achieve that using very long uh, DNA fragments. And what you can do is sequence the junction. Right? This is this uh, made pair uh, library preparation type that allows you to uh, create very long pair than read, essentially, if you want. And that's very useful for whole genome sequencing, uh, where you can really ma I mean, bridge uh, multiple maybe, uh, of sequencing. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, so uh, let's go back to this. Uh, so the first line is uh, information about the read, the lane, the location. This line here, as uh, you can tell, is the actual read itself, right? Now, what's this? Okay. What does that mean? Correct scores. Right. What's these, uh, what's, what are these, uh, what are these uh, letters here? How do you go from uh, letters to uh, to actual quality scores? Yes, you can use this R function. Yeah. But, uh, what is it? What say? Uh, is there? Is there really know how to? You, how does it work? I mean, what's fits? What's the idea? Okay, it's kind of cryptic. Yeah. Right, that's it. 
So basically, each letter is a code, right? And each letter is a coder that's coding for a number between zero and 255. Yeah. Um, the higher the number, the better the quality score, and therefore the more likely uh, uh, you are that the nucleotide is actually a nucleotide that was uh, that's really coming from a DNA fragment. Now, um, because Illumina is using a particular scale when it comes to quality scores, the number that you get out of this, uh, out of this uh, letter here essentially has to be subtracted by uh, 43. This is a function in R that allows you to go from quality score, from uh, a letter like this, back to a number that actually means something uh, in terms of quality scores. Okay? And again, the, this is essentially a lexicographic type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, coding. Uh, we have A, B, C, D, E, and so on and so forth, and E is better than, than, than A, and, and, and so on and so forth, okay? And the goal is really to compact, to essentially get a compact representation of each uh, number. Uh, if you were to actually use, you know, zero to 255 numbers, I mean, you could have a very long line that has, you know, problems, you know, uh, you don't know what to, uh, uh, you don't know what to, you don't know how to isolate, you know, the, uh, the, the numbers. Um, you have you know, uh, one, you have 10, you have you know, 255, you know, and you don't know where to put the boundaries. So this is just a simple code that allows you to encode uh, quality scores. Okay? So essentially that's what it is. You know, each uh, a read uh, is coded uh, by four uh, lines in this format. Uh, one line for the actual read, another line for quality scores, right? and, and some additional information about, uh, about uh, the, the position dot and the lane, and this is the index, uh, what they like with this. Okay. Now, as you can tell here, uh, you know, there is, um, you know, some level of uh, redundancy, right? I mean, it's not really clear why, you know, you should have a duplication of this line. The problem is that these files get very, very, very large, right? This is actually an early uh, kind of, uh, you know, an early, it's coming out of an early Illumina uh, format, so it's coming out of a machine, but basically why you have a duplication of some lines like this which you know, really doesn't make any sense because it really increases you know, the size of your file by, you know, by 25%. So now people are looking at ways to create more complex way of representation so as to limit the, uh, the storage uh, to, to, uh, to store those things. Okay. Um, I yeah. think you mentioned the MOOC for, for presentations at top on the far right. Yes. Um, yes, and then in the right side down. This is the index. Uh, so this is the, this is, um, this is what we'll, I think we'll get back to this. Now, using hyperfit sequencing, uh, because you, see you can sequence so much, you know, the lane, the lane is a unit of sequencing, you can sequence so much, what you can do is to actually pull multiple samples uh, within the same lane, right? Um, you can pull DNA from multiple samples within the same lane. But you need to be able, when you sequence each fragment, to tell which sample it's coming from, right? So what you do is uh, you add a little barcode uh, to the DNA fragments, you ligate a little barcode, which is basically this, to the, to the DNA fragments. Huh? You sequence uh, the fragment itself and the barcode. You read the barcode, it tells you which sample uh, the fragment is coming from. And you put it in, in a, essentially, you put each uh, fragment in a different bit, essentially. Uh, that allows you to, to, uh, to multiplex and to sequence multiple samples the same way. Yeah. So the barcode is the same thing as the index? Yeah, that's right, that's right. What about the ligators? So the, the adapters are, are in addition to this. So what you do is you start with DNA fragments, you add the, ad you add the barcode and then you add the adapters. Um, you want to sequence the barcode itself. You, and then you, know, you get rid of the barcode because that's obviously not, you know, biological. Uh, so when I did the test format, I did index and the GPC already Yeah, so now, you know, Cassava, uh, which is the tool that you use to, uh, to process uh, the reads and basically get to the fast, to this fast read format, is taking care of the demultiplexing, uh, the de-indexing for you. So you don't have these, uh, in, these indices here in the sequence. They're already, they're already been taken out. Uh, okay. So that's really important. Yeah. Um, what's the quality score based on? So the quality score is based on, uh, it's basically, it's, a, it's used as a way to calculate the probability that um, the nucleotide that's shown here is actually correct, right? So it goes into a function. Uh, there's essentially an exponential of this number that goes to a function. Uh, that gives you a probability between zero and one. You know. 
And one means that you know, the sequencer is very confident that the nucleotide that was incorporated is actually the right one. Uh, less than one means that you lose confidence uh, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, in that incorporation. So what's that confidence based on? The confidence is based on, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a good question. So it's based on you know, multiple, it's, it's the, the technology you know, determines that confidence. The scale of a, the quality scores already integrates you know, all, this, uh, all this confidence uh, sort of information. Uh, so the confidence itself is based on uh, the dots, for example, you know, the extent to which the software that's looking for the dots is able to actually detect kind of a well-formed dot uh, that's not overlapping too much with the you know, surrounding dots and so on and so forth. Uh, so you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a process that goes into uh, the quality score that integrates multiple sources of information, essentially. And the keyboard itself is um, minus 10 times log the base 10 And so, and that's useful as a way to get statistics. So, you know, this quality score 30, this is a threshold that's being used uh, of the number of nucleotides that are above uh, Q30, which is you know, the standard threshold of immunized sequencing. That tells you something about the quality of the run. You know, for example, you want to really want to maximize that Q30 number. Uh, you know, you want it to be as high as possible. You know, 80 percent, 90 percent of your nucleotide should be uh, Q30 or more. Yeah, so it was, it was mostly uh, a matter of, uh, 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 you know, this 33 here and how much you would subtract from the code. You used to subtract 66, uh, uh, now you subtract 33. Uh, it's only been mostly two iterations, I think. Uh, so now it's very stable, you know, all the software has been adapted essentially, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's 33 and it's, it's not going to change anymore because it kind of matches now the old uh, thread uh, scoring system that was used before. Yeah, and you have that's that's true. And if you're using an older machine, I mean, you definitely need to be careful about you know the software that you're going to use because most of them now are actually expecting a uh, a newer uh, you know, scaling system. So this is uh, what comes out of uh, paired sequencing. Uh, it's essentially two files, right? The files are paired. Uh, what that means is that uh, this line here, this read here, is matched with the, uh, this is coming from one of the, uh, the, the paired uh, files. This read here is matched with uh, this other read here, the same location in the file, in the other file, right? So you have two files, very, very long, but all of the reads are paired with each other, okay? All of the, the pairs are coming from the two different extremities of the same file. So this is just to give you a sense uh, uh, of the throughput uh, of the sequence cells. Um, people use now are using the high seq 2000 or the high seq 2400. Uh, the first incarnation, or one of the first incarnations of the technology would give you about 30 million reads per lane. Uh, each each uh, lane is part of a flow cell that can hold uh, eight uh, lanes. So the, flow, the lane is the unit of sequencing, the flow cell is higher unit that's what you put into the machine. Um, you, you usually use one lane for quality control uh, when you sequence um, phage DNA, for example, uh, that allows you to calibrate uh, your calling. This is uh, DNA whose identity is known uh, uh, and, and therefore that allows you to, that allows the machine to calibrate the, uh, the, the call, the, the, the nuclear calling. Um, now, uh, using the high seq 2500, uh, you can sequence up to 200 million reads per lane can actually do uh, 16 lanes in parallel uh, with these two flow cells. Um, and, um, and, and you know, because you can sequence so much, uh, now you, uh, what you do now is to, uh, we discussed, is to use barcoding as a way to uh, sequence multiple samples within uh, the, same, uh, the same lane. Uh, and people will use, you know, uh, barcode up to you know, 96 samples I've seen, you know, uh, 
massive multiplexing within the same lane. If you sequencing bacteria, for example, or yeast, uh, you can multiplex aggressively and, and, and sequence many, many samples within the same lane. Right? Now, you have to be careful about the barcodes, right? Because you, uh, the sequencing is still making some mistakes, right? So the choice of a barcode is actually not trivial. Uh, you have to allow, so you have to use, essentially choose barcodes in such a way that if you make a, a mistake in sequencing in the barcode, if you don't quite read exactly the barcode, if you have one mistake, you can still identify the barcode with a uh, high likelihood. Right? So you have essentially to pick barcodes that are as far as, as possible from each other uh, in barcode space, uh, if you want, uh, so that you can tolerate uh, errors in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the sequencing. Uh, but you know, you can build people who's, uh, who's, you know, who work on this, you know, designing barcodes. It's kind of a computer science problem also that's been addressed uh, for, for a while. Um, this is um, this is this just gives you some of the uh, some of the uh, time scales here in terms of sequencing. It's somewhere between you know a couple of days and, and less than less than two weeks, uh, depending on how long the reads are, depending on how many. Yeah, so it really depends. I mean, you know, the, the, the bottom line is that um, you know, the, the, uh, what really matters often is to be able to map your reads back to your replicas, right? Um, so the first um, versions of the technology had issues because you know, the reads are very short. You would, you would sequence, you know, 25 bits per long reads, right? And then you take those reads and you map back to, map them back to, to the genome. And you know, with 25 bits per long reads, you know, for example, in the human genome, that's extremely long. You know, the human genome is 3.4 um, billions of nucleotides. Many, many of these 25 bits per long reads will actually map to multiple locations. Right? Just because you know, if you if you push that you know that idea, if you you know if you sequence you know six nucleotide long reads, you're never going to map to many locations. Um, now you know the reads have become longer now almost by default. You know, people are using you know this 50 bits per long reads now. You know, sequencing for most applications. Uh, and that allows you to map most of the reads with very, very high uh, uh, uniqueness, essentially. Uh, so, you know, 52 is definitely good for most applications. Huh? Obviously, you know, um, if you're sequencing a human genome and if you want to get high coverage, right, uh, you need to sequence more, right? You need to sequence longer reads, you need to sequence, you know. So, that's the situation where you want to do pattern, you know. 100 base pair or 200 base pair long, you know, reads. You can really maximize the coverage so that each nucleotide is covered by many, many reads, right? But for uh, for applications such as RNA-seq, I mean, 50 base pair is, you know, is absolutely fine. Again, for this application, what really matters is to be able to map the reads uh, and, and see, you know, and count how many reads map to a given location. That applies to both RNA-seq and ChIP-seq. This is really what you want to do. Genome sequencing is a bit different where you need really coverage. Yeah, so sometimes they are. Uh, so it depends, you know, obviously on the size of the DNA fragment that you that you put into the sequencer. But if you um, if your size is 300 nucleotides, right, uh, and you do 250 ba 50 base pair uh, per then, you definitely you know the two uh, the extremities are going to overlap, right? Um, again, that's not necessarily a problem when you map them. You know, they're going to overlap, and that's you know that's not really an issue. There are issues when uh, you um, when you have uh, very short DNA fragments uh, that you sequence using long reads. You know, when you have a 100 base pair fragment, for example, and if you sequence it using, using 200 uh, uh, you know, base pair, you know, pair then, for example, you actually start sequencing into the adapters. Uh, and actually, and these adapters end up in your, uh, in, your, in your sequencing data, and you have to get rid of those. And you, know, and you have to be careful because you know, sometimes you know, people might not tell you, you know, that, uh, that you have these adapters in your data. The good thing is that a lot of your liners now, like PWA, are actually uh, able to clip out extremities of reads that don't map at all to the genome. They say, okay, I'm ma mapping, you know, the first 50% of the read, and then suddenly I don't know what happened. What's happening, you know, the rest doesn't map at all. So it's able to clip out essentially the non-mapping, essentially adapter part. So some of the liners now are smart enough to uh, to uh, to take care of that by themselves. Um, but that can you know, lead to uh, to problems. You know, for example, bow ties and do this clipping. I think. Mm -hmm. 
and therefore you know you, you would see a lot of reasons that don't map to the genome, and you'd be like, okay, I know what's going on. Why reasons don't map? Um, so, um, yeah. If I'm um, only interested in differential expression. Uh, no, that's a, that's a bottom line. Yeah, uh, and in fact, you know, very often, you know, uh, we do uh, single read you know, RNA just you know, because, um, and even so, you know, the the, uh, the, the quantification of um, isoform uh, specific expression levels, you know, even though it's helped by doing pair DNA, it's still actually not very good at this stage. Um, so a lot of people have at least in part they kind of given up on uh, detecting. Differences in isoform expression, basically counting how many reads map to give to a, to, a, to, a, to an entire gene, uh, not really looking at isoform, uh, and therefore you know, especially in that case, you know, single hand I guess would be fine. But again, if you want to do a careful analysis of splicing, I mean, you can and definitely a single pair line is helping you, but it's, it depends on how much you want to push your analysis. So, so what's, uh, what's the, uh, less, uh, what do you mean by less? Um, um, we have a hard time picking out uh, lowly expressed transcripts. Right. So is it that one gene is several isoforms? Does it then, do they all become kind of a little thing of that group? Or yeah, no, they do that. That's the, that's the idea is that, you know, if you uh, don't do, an, if you, if you uh, don't do a uh, sort of an isoform aware analysis, you would essentially uh, add up the expression levels of all your isoforms into the expression level of a gene. Uh, you wouldn't try to deconvolute the uh, abundance of each of the isoforms uh, in, your, in your sample. But again, you know, you can you can try, you can always try to deconvolute, you know, the, the isoform specific expression levels. Even if you do, even if you do a single read, I mean, they always read that are going to span uh, exon junctions, you know, and you can you can use that information as a way to you know give you a sense of it's just not very reliable at this stage. Okay. Uh, and therefore, a lot of people are kind of, at least temporarily, you know, uh, given up uh, on, on that. Uh, and and, and the, the truth is that you get a huge amount of information by looking at gene level uh, expression levels. Uh, you know, that always gives you, you know, uh, especially for RNA-seq, you know, information about you know, 35,000 genes. You know, that's plenty to work with. Um, often, you know, if you want to look for isoforms, it becomes kind of a second step. You know, after having looked for differences in depth of uh, Total gene expression levels, huh? you know, you become interested in, you know, in, in digging down into the data a bit more and looking for isoform uh, specific changes. Yeah. How is the depth calculated? So the depth, uh, the depth of sequencing, uh, well, actually, you get back to this. Let me see if I actually I do have, uh, I do have a, a small exercise for you guys. Um, this is, um, this is good. Okay, again, if you want to uh, answer a question. This is getting at the question of, uh, you know, of calculating the, you know, and, and, and the coverage. Um, um, I want you guys to think about this. This is actually a question that you know uh, is frequently asked. Um, you know, what depth you know, do you need? Uh, uh, how do you calculate the depth? Uh, so let's do this exercise together. Let's say that you want to sequence a human genome, right? And you actually want to get a hundred x depth of coverage. Depth and coverage are the same. So how many lanes uh, would you want to sequence? So how do you calculate it? Right. So basically, I mean, the way that you the, the way that you calculate coverage, uh, uh, just I mean, to answer your question and to get back to this, uh, is basically how much you sequence uh, divided by how much. Um, you uh, meant to sequence if you want. Right? So if you want to do whole genome sequencing, you're interested in the entire uh, human genome. The size of a human genome is 3.4 billion nucleotides, approximately. Right? So um, you need to calculate how much you're going to sequence. Right? Uh, so if you sequence one lane, how many reads again? 200 million. 100x, uh, sorry, this is, uh, this is a target. Uh, uh, so basically, the proper 
prior jump is like this. So it's how much you want to sequence, uh, how much you're sequencing. Okay. Um, so let's say this is uh, uh, 200 uh, billion reads per lane. Okay. Um, the number of lanes in this uh, in this equation here, let's say, it's an unknown. Right. Um, if you sequence reads that are 100 bits per long. So this is how much you sequence, okay? And basically this is uh, the amount that you meant to sequence at the bottom, okay, so it's 3.4 uh, billion nucleotides, so that's, uh, okay. And this says, this gives you the coverage, okay? Now if you want to do, uh, let's say that you do pattern sequencing, how would you modify uh, this, yeah? Now each read, uh, each read essentially has two different TIs. Is there any uh, sort of flush factor for the fact that not everything is going to match? And yes, that's right. Yes. So, um, so this is the coverage, uh, you're right. And so now, if you want, if you want x, which is this number, you just have to keep those. So you know, this, uh, this, uh, but it gives you the same. Um, so now you're right. Uh, out of all of these reads here. Not all of them are going to map to the genome, so you do need to have a, a factor uh, that you know takes into account this uh, this incomplete validity. Um, now, typically, you know, for if you sequence a human genome, usually it's about you know you get about 90, 95 percent uh, read mapping uh, rate. But you have other issues, and one of the other issues is the clonality issue that we discussed. You know, typically when you do genome sequencing, when you have clonal reads, essentially reads that map to the same location in the same orientation, you know, you have to collapse them into one, right? And therefore, you know, you can't use them as a, as, as a, as a way to calculate the coverage. Uh, you can't use the ones that you, that you, that you removed. Uh, and that is also a factor that needs to be taken into account. And the number of clonal reads can be actually very high. Uh, you know, sometimes 50% of your reads are actually clonal. Uh, so that means it definitely decreases Estimated coverage, and that you're right has to be taken into account in these formulas. Yeah. But the bottom line is that you know, but just sort of keep this in mind: that coverage uh, is equal to uh, how much you sequenced uh, divided by how much you meant to sequence. If you want to sequence only the exome, right? Let's say 55 megabits of uh, DNA would replace this by 50, uh, 55 uh, billion. Okay. So this is this is the formula that's used. Yes. How would that? Right, so volume and seek, uh, we see the concept of coverage is a little bit you know, different uh, because you have genes that are highly expressed uh, and genes that are you know, not very expressed. Um, so what that gives you is an average coverage. Uh, average coverage meaning average across you know, multiple genes. So you know, whether you know, this is a highly informative measure or not, I mean, this is basically But this is something that, you know, I mean, in RNA-seq, I mean, typically what you want to do is to measure uh, the number of reads. Um, you want to measure clonality. You want to do some additional QT control. But the coverage in RNA-seq is not something that, you know, is, 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 uh, is used too often as a, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a measure of you know, quality or target. You know, it doesn't, again, because of this high disparity between expression levels between genes, it doesn't really mean too much. Yeah. Well, Say again? Yeah, so the real length is this, basically. Right. So, you know, the longer the reads, right, uh, the larger this part is, and therefore the higher uh, your coverage of the other class, the other class right. uh, So, you know, you, this is something that you want to tune, you know, if you, get, if you want to get more coverage, you can increase that, uh, that number of uh, so as to you know, get more reads that overlap into the Um, I, I, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to hurt. I mean, uh, the only thing is that, um, you know, there's a step in uh, on a sick, um, the analysis where you map your reads, uh, try to map your reads back to the genome, 
and you have to take into account uh, uh, you know, exon junctions. Right? So if you have very long reads, um, and uh, you know, depending on how you do the alignment, right? let's say that you have a situation where your long read is actually spanning, let's say, three very short exons. I mean, the software that does the alignment between um, you know, your read and the mRNAs of a genome has to be smart about how to split this read into uh, three different parts, right? And for example, this is not a situation that would be well handled by Bowtie. So Bowtie is actually splitting the reads into two parts. It's not splitting the reads into three or four parts. Um, so it would have problems in terms of alignment you know, in some situations where you have very short text. Again, it's you know, really very much due to the way that these uh, uh, liners operate. Um, what you can do is to align your reads directly to the transcripts. Right? In which case, you would have much less problems. Um, and the bow tie is kind of aligning to, uh, to the genome directly, kind of you know, looking for splice junctions, how to split reads into two, um, without necessarily using uh, data to the transcripts. Um, I think it's a similar way. Right, so this is a very good, very good question. So for example, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, so you know, in my lab we do a lot of whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing, right? So, um, you know, and, and, and you know, frequently, you know, people ask you, well, you know, what's your coverage? You know, what's your average coverage, you know, uh, in exome sequencing? Um, and, you know, and I usually tell them that, you know, average coverage is actually not very meaningful, you know, uh, because the bottom line is that really, what really matters with exome sequencing is, what are, how many nuclear, for how many nuclear that you have coverage that's high enough so that you can do something with it? Right, so minimum uh, coverage or sort of number of bases that are covered with, let's say, 10x, which is 10x is a good uh, sort of minimum number of nucleotides you know, for mutation detection, for example. I mean, this is a more important number. The average, you know, like you say, because there's so much fluctuations between sites, between nucleotides in the genome uh, when it comes to this uh, after, after your line, the average is actually not very meaningful. What's more meaningful uh, in some applications, at least in exome sequencing, is for how many nucleotides you have enough coverage so that you can do something with it. You know? uh, and that's, you know, that uh, definitely depends on you know, the, the, the uh, reliability of coverage. Um, Is there a difference in the coverage caused by the PCR bias? So, differences in coverage uh, because um, just, you know, there are stochastic differences in, in coverage. I mean, you sequence. Uh, you, you, set, you sample, you know, essentially, you know, uh, data fragments from the population. So, you know, they, they kind of randomly, you know, they, they're randomly selected. So, you know, sometimes you select a lot, sometimes you don't select you know, that much, you know, just by chance. So there's, there is uh, stochastic uh, differences. There are stochastic differences. Uh, but you're right, there are additional uh, issues. So, for example, GC content is also, uh, is also playing a role. Uh, there are regions uh, which have particularly high GC content that are a little bit harder to sequence. Um, so the sequencer, you know, is going to see those fragments, those fragments are going to be fed into the sequencer, but somehow there's going to be a bias against sequencing them in the sequencer. So they're not coming out of the, of the machine. And therefore you see deeps, you know, in certain types of uh, regions because, you know, the sequencer has troubles uh, aligning those, uh, those uh, 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 sequencing those reads. Uh, mappability is another issue. Where, you know, Obviously, what a lot of people are doing, whenever you have a read that maps to multiple locations with the same score uh, in a genome, uh, people, what a lot of people do is to say, okay, well, that read, you know, I don't know what's coming from, so I'm going to take it out, I'm going to filter it out. Right? What that means in practice is that if you have a region of a genome that has a copy somewhere else, you're never going to map anything to that region. Because every time that you map a read, a read here, it also maps there. Right? Therefore, it's taken out. So that actually leads to deeps uh, in coverage. Okay. That's also a uh, reason why you have this, uh, this uh, unequal coverage across the genome. Uh, the reads are getting longer, so you know, better and better able to map uh, you know, reads back to the genome in terms of mapability. That definitely you know, is, is uh, getting better. The GC content problem is also uh, sort of getting better um, due to improvement in terms of reagents and
So this is uh, this is quality control. Um, we used uh, this is uh, one uh, aspect of quality control. Quality control. Uh, but it's very important. Um, it's basically uh, uh, you know, plotting this kind of uh, uh, figures here that you may have seen. Um, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, a figure that's showing you uh, quality scores as a function of position within the reads. So this is before alignment. Uh, this is just based on the task you file uh, that you get from your, from your sequencer. And as you can see here, the quality uh, the quality of the nucleotide is actually decreasing as you move away uh, from the beginning of the read. So why is that? Why would the quality of the sequencing of the nucleotide incorporations uh, decrease as you move away from the beginning of the read? Is there a good reason for this? Yeah, yeah there's like a, a gap in sequencing and that will like cover the quality. Yeah, I think, you know, I guess it depends what you mean by gap. Um, is, are you talking about uh, a polymorphism? Or are you talking about. Uh, oh, like a nucleotide didn't get incorporated at step five. Right. That's exactly what it is, yeah, yeah. So remember that you, you know, you're sequencing from clusters of DNA fragments, right? And the signal uh, of you know, the cluster of the fluorescent signal obviously assumes that uh, all of the, the sequencing is, gonna, you know, is going to occur synchronously across uh, uh, all of the fragments, right? So like you say, if there is a misincorporation, or if there is a, uh, let's say two nucleus are incorporated in one after the other by mistakes, you know, somehow, you know, there's a, some some nucleus are kind of I mean, mass malformed a little bit, you know, and they can incorporate. You create a shift, right, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of coordination of all of the DNA fragments, right, of some of the DNA fragments. And as you move away from the beginning of the read, as you incorporate more and more nucleotides, you know, these mistakes essentially keep uh, keep happening. And towards the end, like you say, uh, you end up with uh, uh, essentially you know little uh, synchronization between the DNA fragments from the same cluster. All of the different fragments are telling you a slightly different answer. But, you know, some, some, one of them is telling you red, another one is telling you green. What, what that means is that the signal, the average signal, is kind of a mixture, right? And therefore, uh, uh, the sequencer is not sure about you know, how to call these nucleotides. And therefore, that needs to decrease in quality scores towards the, towards the extremes of the reads. So, this is the reason why you've seen uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, picture here in, in the sequencing. Now, Matt, uh, tomorrow will actually show you how to plot uh, some of these figures uh, based on uh, based on the, the task you file. Um, this is a very important uh, this is a very important uh, quality control aspect. I, I didn't have time to add this to the slide, but uh, just you know, last week actually we did an analytic experiment, and we plotted this uh, after doing the experiment and realized that the two last cycles. Uh, Cycle 51, 52, the average uh, correct score was basically at the bottom of the, uh, the, 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 the figure. So what do you do when you have you know, an extremity like this, which is very bad quality? What do you do? Trim. Right. So if you trim your reads uh, such a way that you can eliminate the bad quality, this is which is the extremity. Right? Um, this is actually old. This is the old uh, quality score scale here. But uh, in, the, in the newer scale, essentially, you would have a, we talked about this Q30 threshold, so you would have a line at Q30, and you see how many of your positions are below this Q30. And if you have a position uh, towards, the, towards the end that are below, to, which is on average below, to, below Q, Q30, you would, uh, that would give you a target in terms of trimming and how much nucleotides you need to trim towards the end. Um, but again, you'll have to learn how to do this. So yeah, so this is another way to think about it, uh, which is that um, you know if uh, you can let the software you know uh, uh, trim you know, the end you know, uh, in a sense. Um, in practice, actually, a lot of software are not very really good at this. Uh, a lot of softwares are based on uh, you know the, one of the parameters that goes into the software is how many uh, mismatches you allow uh, between the read and the reference genome. Uh, and if you have uh, reads that um, you know, have mistakes towards the end, but not too many mistakes, huh? because you already have kind of mistakes or mismatches in the middle of a read, it kind of adds up you know, in terms of number of mismatches, 
and it's above the threshold that you allow, and that means that that read is actually going to be filtered out. So for example, I was telling you the, the, the example that uh, I wanted to put on the slides on the time, where we had this deep apocalyptic clause towards the end. Uh, you know, we were getting 5% of ability. You know, uh, we didn't trim initially at the end, but we were getting 5% of ability. Uh, just trimming the end, just a few nucleotides, you know, allowed us to get back to 90, 90% and about some ability. Um, so the softwares are not always very good you know, in, at, at uh, eliminating those, uh, those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Can you follow me? Can the machine have average like, contribution in the cluster and no independent average? It, that's, that's what it does. I mean, uh, the, the signal is coming from all of the fragments you know, within the same cluster. Uh, so there's definitely you know, averaging uh, that's happening in terms of signal we have you know thousands of fragments within the same spot, and each of each of the fragments is giving little you know little fluorescence, and that adds up uh, you know to a, a, a strong signal essentially. So there is averaging summing up essentially of a signal. So quality you said it's per cluster in the classic files. It's one. Per, it's per cluster. Okay. That's right. It's per absolutely. So let's get to uh, primary data analysis, uh, um, which basically you know, means uh, alignment and quality control. Uh, these are some of the alignment programs that are used, uh, frequently used uh, for uh, short read uh, uh, analysis. Uh, BWA is uh, one that we like uh, in the lab. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, it's actually nice because it can find short indels. Um, it can find uh, situations where you have insertions and deletions within reads uh, compared to the reference genome. Um, it's able to essentially identify these uh, this, uh, this indels. Um, Ebota is now, is now able to do this, uh, but it's a recent feature, and, 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 uh, yeah, and people are not quite sure exactly how well that works. Uh, this has been around for a long while, so this is something that we like to use. I mean, there are, you know, obviously, uh, So, for example, BWA is kind of used to align uh, RNA seq reads um, back to the genome because it's not uh, splice, splicing away, if you want. Ebota is not either, but uh, it's integrated into another program called Top Hat uh, that actually allows this uh, splicing away of that alignment. Uh, that's not the case of BWA. Uh, Ebota is very fast, uh, really, really fast. These are some of the main tools that I used. Yes. So, what did you say you used for RIT? So, we use Bowtie and Top Hat. Uh, so, Top Hat is using Bowtie basically. Uh, so, this is the one we use. So, why do you like BWA better? So, we like BWA better because, um, it, you know, it, it can, it, it's, I think it's better at finding short indels. Um, uh, it seems like it's more accurate um, at finding short indels. I mean, again, you know, this is just us quickly. Uh, Doing some some very basic comparisons between Bota and BWA, um, but you know it seems like it's better. I it also have this soft clipping uh, feature that's nice. Uh, it's able to discard essentially extremities of reads that just you know not mapping at all. It's basically giving up on certain extremities of reads uh, after I managed to uh, map you know the, the one of the extremities. Uh, that's also very nice because you don't don't have to worry too much about you know adapters or something like that. That's BWA or uh, BWA. And in fact, it's true. I mean, so star is uh, it's not it's uh, so these are kind of basic aligners. So star is basically equivalent to top hat. It's uh, splicing away uh, uh, alignment tool. It's actually um, been designed by somebody by a group here, Cosmic Arbo, uh, the Ginger Ass group. Um, and it's a very good tool. It's very fast. Uh, Fifty times faster than top hat uh, on RNA seq alignment. Very very good. I mean, it's not not quite as accurate. Um, but it's it's pretty close, and it's you know so much faster that you know it's it's almost a no-brainer that you know, you get so much data out of your uh, out of your uh, uh, sequencing runs. Um, and BWA is also nice because it can align very long reads. Um, it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good performance. Um, so again, you know we use this a lot, you know, for exome sequencing, for uh, genome analysis. Um, this is more for RNA seq that we use, and also for uh, bisulfate uh, sequencing. 
So inners are uh, uh, short insertions and deletions. So let's say that you have a read um, that has, uh, again, inners you know, often occur within the context of Microsoft, Microsoft Alliance. So let's say that you have a CSEA, CSEA, CSEA in the genome. These, these, uh, these uh, Microsoft allies are very, very uh, sort of uh, unstable. It's once you have you know, CSE, CSEAs, it's very easy for the genome when it, uh, makes, when it replicates to make mistakes and to introduce another copy of CA. Right. So that would be my genome. Let's say that you know, there was application errors in my genome. There was one CA that was added in the context of a bunch of CAs. Right. I'm going to take reads it's coming from my genome. I'm going to align them to the reference genome. Reference genome is, uh, you know, uh, nine individuals. It's a consensus of uh, eight individuals, sorry. Right. Uh, so the re reference genome is going to be different from my genome, right? So I'm going to take reads on my genome that have these insertions of one CA, right? I'm going to map it to the uh, reference genome that doesn't have this insertion, right? It's going to be a difference, right? That's an, that's an indel. That's a, that's, a, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a short, you know, indel. And so the, the, the Alignment tool is going to be is going to have to know it's going to have to identify the fact that um, there was one CA insertion in my read that's not in the genome. And that's basically what the, some of these tools are doing. Um, yeah. So, um, for, for argument's sake, uh, you want yes. Yes. Um, so, what? Uh, any anybody has any, a good answer to this? What do you do if you don't have reference genome? Assembly by itself is, you know, it's a, it feels like it should be, you know, an, uh, it's an intuitive concept, you know. It's uh, basically you have, you know, multiple reads. Um, if they share some similarity or some identity, in fact, you know, you kind of, uh, if, you, if you compare them and they share some, some identity, you kind of uh, merge into these two reads into one longer read, right? And you keep essentially uh, increasing the size of your context like this by kind of you know, merging reads and maps. Yes, that, you know, the longer the reads, uh, the more likely you are to find uh, reads that uh, uh, intersect or overlap and that you can, you know, that, that can help you build your, uh, your context. And, and actually, the adapter problem uh, is that yeah. if you sequence the adapters at the end, that's kind of stable in. Yeah, for sure. Because you get a lot of experience. Because you're doing paradigms and you can trim both ends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both ends. So, um, you know, uh, there multiple, multiple ways to answer this. Huh? Um, so a lot of people just drop them. Uh, it's actually mostly, most of the time it's fine because, you know, you have
have so many of them anyway, so yes, you lose a few reads and it's not a big deal. Um, you know, there are people who, um, uh, when you have a read and maps to a limited number of locations, right, you keep the read and you can decide two, you can, you can do two things. One of which, let's say that you have a read and maps to 10 locations equally well. I guess, just curious, what, what, what can we do uh, uh, when we get this type of situation? Uh, two, I think there are two ways to handle this. Just to divide it, split it. Yeah, yeah okay, three ways. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's tricky because, you know, you want to be in a situation where you have counts, and counts, you know, is, is very helpful when it comes to statistics on, on short reads. So if you start, um, you know, splitting the weights of a read across multiple locations, then you don't you lose counts. You don't have counts anymore. You have like you know fractions, you know, and that is not helping you too much in terms of analysis. Um, so you want to stay in a situation where you have counts. So counters. Yeah. So yeah, that's assuming that you you really can't. Uh, so yeah, the pair and uh, reads you know often help you uh, find uh, perfect matches and, and uh, optimal matches. There's still situations, especially when you don't do pattern anywhere. You can't tell. You have a read that maps equally well to 10 locations. What do you do? Yeah, could be aggressive or other Is there anything simple, simpler? Random. Yeah, random. So that's one, that's one of the two solutions. You, you, know, you, you, uh, you, know, you have 10 equally good places. Uh, you, take, you can say, okay, my read is going to you know, map to that location. That's it, random. You pick one of the 10 random. It's not about it's not about what you do things. You know, you keep counts. You still have counts. Huh? Uh, the read is coming from one place. Uh, it's not coming from you know, by definition, it's not coming from you know, from two different places. The actual read is coming from a cell. You know, from a single from a, from a, and it's just you know you just randomly assign it to location. But you know, if you get another read at the same location, you assign it you know randomly, and it's going to you know, map to a different location. It's like and so on and so forth. So random assignment is, is good. No, no, I mean, that's, uh, you know, people do that for organizing as well. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you do with that? Like, you commanded that you, you know, one takes a pick, but another commanded another pick. Yes, and you can't tell. I mean, basically, you're going to put yourself in a situation where there is no um, difference at all if these are, you know, identical genes. Uh, you know, you. So I mean, so some of the so, so this is uh, this is uh, um, this is a slightly more complicated situation uh, where some of the some of the software that allow that essentially assign reads to uh, transcripts. Uh, this is you know cufflinks, you know scriptures, you know. So these tools are uh, 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 can can align you know differently. I'm talking about more about you know sort of basic aligners, you know the line to the genome. When it comes to RNA-seq, you can do a probabilistic alignment. That's, that's a bit more complex. But when it comes to aligning reads back to the genome, again, if you have a multi-mapper, you have two, 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 two solutions. One is to assign the reads randomly. The other one is to duplicate the reads. Okay, say so my read is going to become 10 reads. I'm going to put one copy here, one copy here, one copy here. These two, uh, so Bowtie is actually using, by default, second, uh, the, uh, the second uh, option. Uh, BW is actually use, using the first one. VWA, if you have a read and maps to multiple locations and it's not too many locations, it actually assigns it to one location. Both times actually assigns that read to all uh, locations. But there's a threshold. If you have a read that maps to more than 20 locations, it says, okay, I really have no idea where this read is coming from. I'm, I'm taking it out. Questions? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly not saying that it's perfect. I mean, uh, you definitely have to be, you know, very careful. So, I would say this is a situation here where you would benefit from longer reads, uh, from longer reads that essentially would, you know, even good pattern reads actually, uh, that would allow you to map your, you know, more of your reads, especially these reads that are a bit tricky. Obviously, everything that I'm saying, you know, everything we're discussing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, mapping these reads that are ambiguous, you know, doesn't really apply to, you know, 
if you are interested in the problems of in the problem that involves repeats in the first place. There are actually people who are interested in understanding what are the transcription factors that actually map to transposons, which are viruses in the genome. There are actually you know, families of transposons that carry binding sites for proteins. There's a, there's a, a famous uh, transposon that carries a binding site for 53, for example. It kind of jumps around, right? And it, when it jumps to some location, it actually brings the 53 binding site with it. So there are actually people doing, uh, trying to map the location of these insertions in the genome. Uh, and, you know, and that's where you know, your binding site is fundamentally in a, in a repeat region. So you know, everything that I've been telling you about repeat doesn't apply to this. I mean, you, know, this you, you would have to do a very careful analysis with longer reads to really be able to, uh, to tackle the situation. I'm not talking about the general situation where, you know, where I, you don't, you're not interested in a, uh, a biological problem that involves repeats. But in your case, um, I think that you know, yeah, you probably benefit from longer reads um, so that you can map um, the locations of these findings more accurately. But that's kind of a specific problem. Who knows? So, um, I guess what I sort of touched on is the multiple match problem you were just pointing out the beginning about. Um, is, so sometimes people get excited, oh, these three homologs all differentially expressed in these conditions, um, you know, there's probably some functional thing. So what you're saying is, if you know the details of the mapper, it might just be because in some samples right. there was application of this highly repetitive mm -hmm. highly similar region, and in the other samples it was more amplified than dissimilar. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you definitely you have to know. You keep track of some yeah. logs and yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, again, this uh, this amplification, this PCR duplicates, you know, is usually reasonably easy to detect because it's very usually focal. So typically what you have is that you have you know, a region that's you know, reasonably uniformly covered in terms of reads, and you have suddenly you have one read that's duplicated you know, 200 times. So you can tell, you know, it's kind of you know, a lie of essentially this coverage, and you can tell that you have a PCI duplicate problem. Oh, I'm not, I didn't mean that. I meant you multiple meant? mapping. Okay. Especially for if a program, if, the, if your mapper randomly assigns, yeah. then in a sample in which that I see, I see. That region is very similar, uh, tended to get more, more fragments. Um, they're going to appear to be low yeah, over yeah. many homologs, whereas in another sample where a more a less repetitive, a less similar region was more amplified, uh, it, it'll all concentrate on the actual. Yeah. No, look, and, you know, and there are there are you know ways to 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 work around this. You know, I think one way to go about this is to focus on the regions that are unique. If you can, if you can uh, uh, base your quantification on the regions of a genome that are unique and but are not found in other places, I mean, you probably would get better estimates. Um, well, but some, you're right. Some genes are, you know, have perfect duplicates, you know, uh, in the genome, and there's no way that you can tell, you know, uh, which the, the, you can tell them apart for um, these short reads. So but for genes for which you have, you know, slight differences. Um, you should be able to use those slight differences as a way to uh, to to, uh, you know, to to uh, to get a better estimate, uh, knowing that you know there will be locations in the same gene that have no differences, and therefore what you get from these from these regions is not you know, reliable in terms of quantification. Well, I think the problem though is that if you mask, you get very low coverage of those genes, and then you have no power. Yeah. And I I mean I haven't done this for any peak data, but we did this for stage data, right. and what we found. There were whole gene families that, because they had the same tag, uh, tag, were getting thrown out of the analysis, even though they might be highly expressed in the sample. Yeah, yeah. And you couldn't say anything about an individual in the family, but you could have said something about the, the family. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, yeah, I no, it's a, it's a tough problem. It's, uh, uh, it's a tough. I think you know. Again, I, I think you know there might be ways to use, uh, at least to use to get some a priori type of. Uh, you know, Maybe to get a prior, you know, using the, the regions that are unique uh, uh, in each of those genes, uh, because there are always, you know, slight differences in, you know, in terms of you know, the, the, the gene family members that can potentially help you, uh, uh, you know, set the, uh, the prior and expression levels. But you know, yeah, it's a tough problem. Well, for a second mapping step, where you right. second mapping step would merge yeah. you know, very close homologs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Priority, yeah. I guess. But yeah. yeah. Are there programs that have been integrated into the, into the aligners that kind of tell you like what regions are sort of problematic and they're known to be highly similar? I mean, that would be helpful, right? Like, um, yeah, 
So it's actually, you know, it's, uh, it's there in the output. Um, you know, the, the, the output of these aligners has information, so you know, about, you know, which reads were multi-mappers, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, the, the information about all the locations that read maps to, even if a program is choosing one at random, it still tells you where else you know, the, uh, the read was mapping. So that information is there, you know, in the output format. You know, and it's up to you basically to use it or not. Um, so this is the situation, at least for people who use it. There's also a mappability track in CSC, which yeah. some engineers are going on to check that. Maybe more than just underlying the idea of one. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think part of the problem is files are so big that we tend not to use all that information. I mean, if you notice the output of the, what was it, the, the double frequency network? 200 gigs or something, 500 gigs. I mean, that's like my whole hard drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, for sure. And that's only one, that's one output file. Yeah, so yeah. to go through it again and see where everything has got mapped is, you know, daunting, let's put it that way. Yeah, there's, there's, one, there's one key, um, a little piece that some of these aligners do well and some don't, and it's called mapping quality. It ends up in the, the BAM file. And mapping quality, uh, when we when I, when I first think mapping quality, I think, you know, how well does this read map to its, its region, that is, how many mismatches does it have? But actually, that's not what mapping quality is. Mapping quality is how well, or basically, what's the probability that I've mapped this read to this location and not someplace else? So mapping quality, if it's, if it's implemented correctly, um, is a measure, basically, of uniqueness. Um, it, of the unique mappability of this read. So very high mapping quality means that I'm sure this read is here. It can't go anyplace else in what I'm, where I'm mapping to. A lower mapping quality means that it might be someplace else. And so you can use that, that single measure as a really rough estimate of um, what's going on in the region without having to know what the absolute number of other uh, map mappings is and without having to know um, about the uh, repeat region that this maps to. So mapping quality, if you have a good aligner that's giving you back good mapping quality, can help you a lot with figuring out what's going on in an individual region, uh, or gene for that matter. So repetitive sequences would have lower mapping quality than the That's repetitive, re sequences that come from repeats will have, uh, the ones that are mapped back to the genome will have low mapping quality, that's correct. That would agree with it, right? Because reads that are in the moment might change, and then they have their But then you might read that they were those three, so they were a little bit shorter, so they cannot map their ends to the computer. And then you can conclude that there's potential suppression because in one sample you see those three and another sample you don't see. And they still, you know, the quality was good for the reads that you see, but the ones that they don't see. Yeah, but you, you know about lies by the number of reads that you map, though. I mean, all of these, you know, the, the FE camps, RP camps, you know, there's normalization by the total number of reads. Your sequence, um, so that helps. You know, uh, so if you have a, a sample that tends to have an average, you know, low mapping quality, you can have you know fewer reads. You know, they, they, you, you, you normalize the total number of reads, and you can get back to scale of that. Um, so, um, but, but that's also not for any particular region. So it's yeah, it's not region specific. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, sure, so I mean, definitely, you know, it's part of a quality control. You should make sure that, you know, your samples, especially when you compare samples, uh, that, you know, all of the metrics, you know, including uh, overall number of uh, good mapping reads are similar. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have, it, it, it's likely that you can have problems comparing uh, your samples. So anyway, so this is, uh, this is just kind of a workflow here. This is not only an R, this is, uh, this is a, uh, this is just, you know, uh, Unix command line. You know, this is typically what you would have to do uh, to align short reads using BWA. You have to you get your reference genome, uh, typically from your CSC. Uh, you have to, this is just, uh, uh, this file here is a big archive uh, that has, this is a human genome. It has, uh, each chromosome has a different file. Uh, so when you extract the files from the archive from using this command here, you have multiple files on, and you have to concatenate them, you have to assemble them back into one file. 
you have to index these reference genome. Um, and what does that mean to index? Anybody knows uh, why and what that means to index a, a, a genome? Yeah, so basically it's, it's, it's essentially building a data structure uh, that's going to allow you to align your short reads to a reference genome really, really fast. As you can imagine, you know, one very basic way to align short reads back to a, a genome is to take that read and scan the entire genome for matches to that read, right? And you scan, you know, 3.4, you know, billion nucleotides, you know, one by one like this, right? If you were to do that for 200 million reads, uh, you would basically, you know, you start now, you, you finish next year. Right? So that's not obviously a, a, a good option for mapping reads. So what uh, people have come up with is data structures. It's basically tree-based structures uh, that allow you to directly go to the more likely matches of your short reads on your, on your genome. It's essentially building a tree-based structures out of a genome that allows you to very quickly, when you have a short read, kind of thread it through a tree structure and identify you know, likely you know, matches in you know, this way really quickly. Um, uh, and that really uh, works very well, and that really uh, uh, increases the speed of uh, the short uh, mapping process by you know, uh, orders of magnitude. Uh, and now it basically takes you know, less than a day to uh, align short reads uh, from one end, for example, to the genome, to a human genome. Uh, so this, is, uh, this command here is doing the indexing building this data structure that allows you to search uh, for matches between short reads and reference genome really faster. Uh, so that builds an index, which is this uh, part here. And basically the alignment process itself. Uh, this is, you know, uh, a line, the align command in VWA. What is this here? Uh, is, uh, does anybody, is anybody using VWA here? What is, uh, what is uh, dash T4? Um, okay. Some of the data here. That's right, yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, this is a very useful uh, a feature of uh, many, many aligners now. Uh, the ability to use multiple CPUs or multiple cores on the machine. You know, most machines now, you know, have multiple cores. I mean, you know, this, this laptop here, I think has two cores. Uh, you know, most machines have multiple CPUs. Uh, and these tools are actually nicely able to, uh, to harness this multi-core uh, multi aspects of most machines now. And basically, we are you know, distributing multiple uh, chunks of your short read file to different CPUs uh, so that the mapping can process uh, can be processed pretty quickly. Uh, and so dash T4 tells the program that you can use four cores or four CPUs uh, uh, for the alignment. Uh, we've actually done some tests uh, with uh, this. We try to see how you know much we can get you know by you know, uh, adding cores. You know, and realize the BWA is actually not very good uh, at uh, doing this uh, on this uh, parallelism uh, implementation. When you go past eight cores, uh, essentially it's kind of a diminishing return. I mean, you, your, your, your speed actually plateaus very quickly if you add more cores after, uh, after eight cores. So it doesn't, you know, basically it doesn't really matter if you have eight cores, if you use eight cores or 20 cores, uh, uh, it's gonna, you know, the speed is about the same. It's just parallelism, you know, it's complicated. You, you know, when you, when, you, uh, when you parallelize processes, you have to make sure that, you know, they're synchronized, you know, that, you know, the, the process that they're waiting for, you know, each other to finish. Uh, and because of this uh, need for coordination between threads and between uh, processes, I mean, the, 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 the number of uh, cores that uh, you know, one can effectively use I mean, is, is not as high as you would like. So basically, you know, uh, use eight cores, you know, I think that, uh, that would give you the best performance for this. Uh, but there's still you know, a huge gain of performance, you know, uh, over to just using one core. Uh, so this is, uh, so BWA is uh, uh, aligning Reads that would be in this part here, uh, using this index here with these many CPUs, uh, and that goes into a file that's a binary representation of alignments uh, in BW format. Uh, not something that you can look at. If you look at, you'll see just you know such a, a gibberish. Uh, but you can convert this uh, format here into a format called SAM format, which is a, uh, a human readable uh, uh, format for short reads. Uh, this is just using this comment here. Uh, this is a similar process using pattern sequencing uh, reads. Uh, so you, uh, in VW, you have to align each of the, uh, uh, remember that what you get is two files uh, from each extremity of the fragment. So you have to align the two files independently. And then when you convert to a SAM format, you, uh, you, you 
merge these two files into one. Yeah. Do you have a minimum RAM that might be coming back? Uh, I think there's a minimum RAM. It's actually pretty good that it's using RAM. It's actually not using too much. I think it's uh, just a few gigs. You know, it's uh, you can use it. You know, on, on So this this part here is actually is smarter than uh, than uh, than it looks. I mean, it's, you know, you see, it's using Linux. You know, it's, uh, it actually is able to uh, do some local realignment. So if it finds, for example, in Pattern Reads, if it finds a good match in one location, not uh, in the the other match is not initially mapped uh, to the genome because somehow it was maybe below threshold. This tab here is actually going to use a a, slight, a slower but a better alignment process called Smith Waterman alignment to actually try harder to align the other read uh, when it's found a match a map for a match for one of the uh, one of the other read. So it's actually you know it's it's uh, doing this kind of smarter uh, realignment of the other read uh, when they only find one match. Uh, this 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 is what this process is doing. Yeah. Does both times work? Bona is actually it's uh, it's uh, it's doing also this big waterman type of alignment, I believe, uh, uh, but it's doing it in one step. It doesn't uh, it's uh, it doesn't you don't need to do this. It's directly taking into account uh, the, the, the two uh, the, the two files at the same time. What is that called again? Smith waterman. Smith waterman. New new versions of the EWA don't have this two step process. The new newer versions of the EWA don't have. This I thought that was the question. I started with BWMM. Yeah, yeah, it just came out. BWMM. Are you talking about BWMM? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. We haven't started using it, but uh, it's not published yet. Yeah, I think people have, you know, done some. I mean, it's not published yet, but, you know, it's on the archive, and people have started, you know, going crazy and making their own benchmarks and everything. It looks like it's fine, you know, let's say it's, it's pretty good. Uh, it's it's you know on par with I think the original BWA, but I think it's 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 faster. It can you know process longer reads and uh, it can do more things basically. And it doesn't have this kind of weird two-step process uh, that that just doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, but we have another question. Okay, so this is uh, Carl Pater. Uh, this is pipe alignment. So this is a complex process, and this is you know. A lot of people are working on this. So this is aligning RNA seq reads back to the genome. Um, so this is basically, you know, again, uh, a difficult process because you have these, uh, you have these, you know, the, the uh, when the uh, transcripts are processed, you have the uh, you know, exons, you know, introns are spliced out, and you have uh, exon junctions that are formed, and these exon junctions don't exist when we reference human genome. Right? So when you map your RNA seq reads back to the reference human genome, a lot of reads don't map because they the reference doesn't contain these exon junctions. So there are smart programs like Top Hat or Saw uh, that actually allow you to recover these splice junctions. Uh, but by basically, it's a two-step process usually. Uh, the program start mapping all of the reads back to the genome. They look for uh, good matches, basically matches that are within exons. Right? Um, and they have a whole bunch of reads that actually don't map in the first step. These are all of the reads that map across uh, exon junctions. So the, program, the programs are doing is trying a little bit harder to split those reads into two, right? And, and, and split those reads into two in such a way that uh, the splitting occurs at locations where you have this, uh, this splice signals, you know, this uh, splice acceptor and donors, uh, and, 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 and basically trying to recover uh, some of those, uh, some, some matches, you know, that span these junction in this way. Um, and and, and, and um, essentially, you know, uh, map more reads process. Again, this is not a, a, a this is not a, a simple process. This is you know the object of a lot of research. Uh, Top Hat was the first program to implement uh, this splice alignment uh, process. Uh, it's you know still used you know quite a lot. We actually use it quite a lot in my lab still, but uh, there are better programs like uh, you know we can talk about Star, which is I think is becoming uh, a new standard when it comes to uh, splice alignment. Um, this is just here the type of uh, command that you would have to type uh, for top hat. 
you would have to uh, download an index. Again, all these tools, you know, they're really, uh, uh, they're really using an index version of the genome. They can work on the genome itself. So either you build index yourself or you download it from, uh, from uh, a website. Uh, the, the top hat people have uh, nicely made available a lot of indices uh, for the genomes. So you can download it directly and not have to build it yourself. In fact, this is just the command line here that you would have to type. So it's top hat. There's one, uh, there's one specific option in top hat uh, in which you have to specify when it comes to paired and reads the distance between uh, the two reads uh, in, uh, on, the, on the DNA fragments. So if you were to uh, sequence, let's say, 300 base pair long reads, uh, 300, 300 base pair long fragments uh, using, let's say, 100 base pair pair then, you would have 100, 100, and 100 in the middle. So this insert size here is what you have to specify to top hat in order for it to do its job. It actually requires that you, that you specify this parameter here. Um, and you know, and, and, and uh, you know, usually this is something that you can get you know, from looking at the gels, you know, looking at the size of your fragments, you look at the average size, and that basically uh, gives you information about, you have to subtract the size of the actual reads that you, that you sequence, but what's in between uh, essentially is what you have to specify. And, and this is just also the number of CPUs. That's uh, weird though, right? Because they get the distribution Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you have to, so it's, yeah, you have basically have to uh, specify the average. You know, yeah. In practice, what we do in my lab is actually to uh, estimate uh, this number here. We estimate it by aligning uh, uh, RNA-seq reads, parallel RNA-seq reads uh, um, to a database of transcripts from RAPSeq. Just because you know, often you know, you have to look at the gel, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's sometimes you know, the, the average is actually not so easy to find in the gel. It's kind of a smear, you know. And, um, so we actually estimate it ourselves by mapping the short reads to a database of transcripts, calculating the average uh, insert size in those uh, in those transcripts, and then using that, in, that information back into Top Hat uh, for this parameter. Yeah, it's a yeah, bit longer, but it helps. Yeah, Also specify some deviation. But, well. but it doesn't, it's not required. So this parameter is absolutely required. Uh, the standard deviation is uh, something that you can look at. How high Q sub W I think it does, no? Yeah. So something I've never understood about this is uh, so you say 100. That I mean, in this particular case, it's right. you know, it will be 100. But let's say you, whatever you're using, 100 or 100. Does it? Is it very strict? Does it have to be 80 for all of your alignments, or does it have a sort of a fudge factor? So, I mean, you know, that can be set by the standard deviation. You can also specify the standard deviation. But the bottom line is that you know this is what you have to say. So, it's a good question as to whether you know if you were to specify a slightly wrong number, how would it impact the actual alignment? And I don't know the answer to this. Well, we tried that, and it had a huge impact. Yeah, that's okay. Because we, we 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 thought we had the right number. That's why, you know, again, what we do is to estimate that number for every run, every analytic run, we actually estimate that number uh, by mapping uh, short reads to uh, rest of transcripts, transcript sequences themselves. And, you know, and you get an average, you know, from this, uh, from, uh, from this mapping. And that's pretty fast because RefSeq, a RefSeq database, you know, is a small file compared to a whole genome database. Uh, so you can map all your reads, you know, to, uh, to RefSeq transcripts, get the average uh, insert size, Feed that, feed that into into top hat um, very detailed you know, process. You know, so you also use a hollow control to know because the other issue with RNA seq is you can have DNA contamination, so you can figure out how much map to the RNA seq. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we you know we don't we don't do that, uh, but you know definitely uh, you know could be used. You know, that's for sure. If you have. Uh, No, that's right. I mean, this number is only for pattern. But again, you know, it goes back to the question of pattern versus single read and you know, in, in RNA seq. And you know, pattern is you know, if you want, if you really want to look for isoforms, you know, that's really a requirement. Again, even so, it's actually, you know, it's not going to give you perfect isoform information. But uh, you know, this is going to help. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so it's it's uh, but definitely you know, we definitely do pattern sequencing uh, for RNA seq. 
one of those things, you know, you might, you know, initially look only at the uh, uh, gene level, uh, expression level, so, but it's nice to have, you know, the uh, possibility to go back to the data at some point and look for isoforms, especially for specific genes. You know, often, you know, I'm not so much interested in, uh, you know, a global analysis of isoforms across the genome. You know, you use your, uh, you know, you use your uh, gene level, expression levels as a way to narrow down to a pathway to a couple of genes. And then you can go back to the, uh, to, to those genes and do a very careful analysis of spicing on those. And, uh, and I think that's where uh, Cal and uh, RNA is really useful. Did you discuss that with the Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, the question is, you know, if you, if it's, uh, if you say, uh, you know, 110 instead of 100, because you're not going to, you know, yeah. if you have a gel, if you can see, if you can look at the gel, you're not going to make a huge mistake, you know, in your, uh, in your estimation. Uh, so, you know, is, what's the impact of being wrong by 10 base pair? Uh, I don't know. I think, you know, you, said, you seem to say that uh, it would be significant. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 the, the impact is most significant. Right, so, um, yeah, so this is, you know, after you do the alignment, you get the original quality control, um, and some of the typical quality control measures that uh, people look at is uh, what's the fraction of map reads, uh, what's the fraction of unique mappers, uh, what's the fraction of core reads, P7 duplicates. Uh, these are the really important, uh, uh, important uh, quality control measures. Okay. Questions so far? Um, any more questions? So what you said, what, yes, what are clone reads? Huh? Right, so clone reads are PCR duplicates, basically. Uh, so basically, these are reads that, uh, at least from when it comes to hybrid sequencing after mapping, would map at the same position. Okay, that you have two reads that map at the same exact position in the same orientation. These would be called uh, PCR duplicates or clone reads. Again, you know, multiple ways to deal with those. Uh, typically, what you do is to collapse them into one. So it's like a, having a duplicate, but you know, these reads are not independent. You know, so there's no uh, counting them twice is, you know, would introduce some artifact uh, because they're not independent. So typically you collapse them into one uh, and, uh, and count them one at once. So again, reads are mapped to the same location in the same orientation. That's the definition of the reads. With, uh, thanks to Kevin sequencing, uh, you can reduce you know, the number of, uh, of global reads uh, by looking for duplicates would have to be uh, PCR duplicates for both reads, essentially. Um, yeah. um, you see, again, you, know, you can very much easily tell that if you do more PCR rounds, you know, typically get more clone reads. It's, it's a major issue when it comes to mutation detection. Uh, clone reads are very, very bad when it comes to mutation detection. Because again, it duplicates, you know, uh, certain reads, you know, and it's an artificial duplication, so it's not, it's really not that uh, When it comes to RNA-seq, um, you know, the effect is, is maybe a little bit milder, uh, just because RNA-seq kind of average, uh, uh, you know, read counts across, you know, large, uh, you know, large region. You know, the, the, the number of, uh, the, the way that you measure the transcript levels, counting every reads, map to a given gene, dividing by count by the size of the gene. So there's an average, you know, that goes on into this calculation, and therefore, you know, if you have one read that's duplicated many times, you know, the effect of this duplication, if it's only local, is going to be uh, diluted by the fact that the rest of the, uh, the gene is not going to be duplicated. So it's, it's not as bad, you know, when it comes to RNA-C, but for um, mutation detection, it's very bad.
issues is, you know, as you sequence more and more, right, uh, if you sequence, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 10 billion reads, you know, at some point, it's just, you know, you're going to find, you know, situations where you have two reads that map to the same location in the same orientation. So that means to look long, right? And that actually applies, you know, for some reason, I've already expressed, for some genes that I've already expressed, like GAPTH. GAPTH, you know, even if you do, um, uh, you know, very few reads, if you, if you sequence very few reads in RNA-seq, uh, and if you map your reads, if you look at GAPTH, you're going to see a lot of reads that look like they are prone reads, right? But it's just that because GAPTH is actually pretty short and extremely highly expressed, so yes, you're going you're gonna to find, you know, you're going to find uh, reads, you know, the same location and the same orientation. And these might or might not be clonal reads. So in fact, you know, the way in theory that you should collapse clonal reads is to take into account you know, expression level. So if you have a read that, you know, if you have a gene that's highly expressed, yes, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna find reads that look like clonal reads, but not really clonal. So you will have to collapse a bit less in theory. Right? So collapsing of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the clonal looking reads it should be, you know, uh, 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 should be a function of the actual expression level of the I don't know if I'm making myself. No, 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 no. And, and, and I don't know if that's really, you know, that's something that's done, but, you know, that's something people have been talking about, you know, how to collapse reads in a slightly smaller way, as opposed to the, the one that we're doing now. But, um. So in a situation like this, you just try to force it that it's not duplicated in the part you Yeah, exactly, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And to tell you the truth, because of this, in fact, in my lab with RNA seq, we actually don't we don't collapse clonal reads. We don't collapse clonal reads actually uh, in RNA seq. We do collapse clonal reads all the time uh, when, when it comes to uh, uh, genome sequencing for mutation detection because of this issue with highly expressed genes and not being sure which reads are clonal, which reads are not. We actually end up not uh, collapsing clonal reads. With all of its issues, uh, but um, you do this kind of like a similar to what you showed for the. Uh, yeah, we do. We look at the numbers, and if the numbers are extreme, I mean, we definitely say, okay, you know, there's a problem. I mean, or we have to, uh, we have to uh, redo the experiment. Or, uh, but if you know the numbers are reasonable, then we just say, okay, fine. You know, that's, so that's reasonable. Yeah. So. Uh, it's like if you have output the library, then then that comes from one we see very frequently 60% uh, clonal reads. Uh, 60%? Yeah, yeah. And you would have it the same? Yeah, we, we would keep it. We would keep it. Yeah, yeah. If it's, you know, 90%, it's okay, no, no, that's, you know, just, you know, 